Okay, welcome everybody on this Thursday spring morning. Um, we are going to be talking about mold today. This is a one hour core class and it's going to be great. First of all, we need to go over some rules and regulations to get credit online. You guys probably already know all these, but we have to do it. So first and foremost, you have to have your first and last name available for me. I am Tana and I will be moderating the class for Jared. Um, to get full credit, you have to have your video on the whole time. And Jared will be giving four words, keywords, whatever he decides. And um, it's write those down at the end. I will give you a Google form in the chat and you need to fill that out. It'll have all your, your um, agent information for it so that Jared can submit your information and make sure you get credit for the class. If um, you got to make sure that you download that Google form into some format onto your computer, iPad, whatever you're working with, so that when this Zoom is over, you still have access to that. So make sure you remember to do that, because as soon as I close the Zoom, that Google form will be gone. Also, um, in the chat, I have put um, his packet about the class today so you can follow along online as well as in person. Um, I will do that again in the chat uh, for those of you that have missed it when I'm done. Also, if you are driving, you cannot get credit for this class. If you're doing anything but giving full attention for this class, um, you won't get credit. Uh, one more thing on those code words. Do not ask each other um, for those words if you've missed it. Try to chat me personally in the chat box um, because I will be able to, I will be moderating you so I'll know if you um, just accidentally missed hearing it or if you were even paying attention um, to give it that word to you. Um, so don't give it to each other. And anything else? I don't think I missed anything else. Is there anything else, Jared? I think that's it. Okay, perfect. Um, and, and I guess the only other thing is I welcome any participation. So if you have questions or comments, if you'll put those in the chat and Tana will help uh, let me know because I won't see them. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So this is always fun. Uh, at least I have some people here and I'm not just talking to a screen. So. <laughs> Uh, so again, my name is Jared, and with Pillar to Post, we do home inspections. Uh, Pillar to Post is a nationwide franchise. So uh, here in Utah, we have offices here that cover central Utah. Uh, and then there's a Salt Lake office, a Park City office, and a Cedar City, St. George area. So uh, we've got the whole state covered. And I think that's probably the biggest difference is we all work together a lot where, you know, if you hire Bob's inspections, you're getting Bob and his experience. And uh, with us, there's a lot of stuff where even that's what I was just doing right now is what about this? How do I do this? So we're constantly interacting with each other. So you're getting that mind share. Uh, so I've been doing this since 2006. So I've uh, been through a little bit, seen a few homes. Uh, one of my guys was an electrician for seven years. Another guy was a uh, radon mitigator for 10 years. Another guy did mold remediation. So we have a lot of varied background and, and all of that gives a little bit different perspective on different things. Um, I taught a class yesterday on just understanding home inspections, so it's more geared towards new agents. But one of the things that that always surprises me is when it comes to things like like medical, people don't really think too much about. Well, I'm going to go get a second opinion. You know what? But with homes, it's like, well, the inspector said this, and I guess my thing is, is yes, we have a lot of experience, but at the end of the day, we're just giving opinions, and so it doesn't hurt to get another opinion just to make sure, hey, and the, the one that I, the example I always come back to is uh, I remember I walked down to the laundry room was in the basement, walked down to the basement and there was water everywhere. That, the drain had backed up and um, big mess, lots of, so the next few months I realized, oh, I'm being a little over dramatic on drain clogs and things like, just because it was so painful for me and I was kind of projecting that to all the clients. And so there's things like that, that, that will, will come up. And so getting that other opinion. So, um, and, and I, and that's one of the reasons I teach these classes is so that, you know, you have a resource. So it's not just my inspections that I, you know, if one of my inspectors, you want a second opinion, but any, I have a lot of agents that will say, Hey, I actually had one just uh, yesterday where 
she had a client, she's up here in Utah County and, and her client used an inspector down in St. George, buying a house down in St. George. And so she didn't have an inspector and hey, and he said this, what does that mean? How that's, you know, and so we chatted for a little bit just to help explain. So that's, that's what I'm there for. Um, okay, get into the class. We're gonna talk about mold. There's a lot to cover in one hour. Uh, the funny thing is, is when I started teaching classes about 15 years ago, I remember that I had a mold class, I had a meth class, um, and those two specifically, I went to different brokerages and said, hey, I, you know, let me teach these CE classes in your office. And I actually had two different brokers at different offices that said, yeah, that's too much liability for my agents. I don't want them thinking they're experts. I don't want them, no, that, no, let's not do those classes in my office. So it's just things have changed so much where everybody wants information that that I mean, you say that now and you're like, what are you talking about? Why would a broker ever not want their agents to get educated And that? So, so I am not trying to make you an expert in an hour. We're not going to make you mold experts. So don't walk away from this thinking that you are. Um, and uh, in, in a lot of cases, I'm not a fully an expert when it comes to remediation and how do you take care of it all. But I understand a lot of the testing and just a lot of the stuff. And so that's the main thing is not so much knowing everything, but knowing where you can get everything. So you can come to me. If I don't know it, I've got people that I can reach out to. And that's uh, that's the goal there. So the class we're going to cover is um, there's a handout that kind of goes through all of that. So either you download it, grab it here. We want to understand a little bit more what is mold because we hear that four letter word, especially in real estate. And it has a lot of connotations, a lot of uh history. And so we want to understand how that really applies to the home because mold is an issue, uh, but not always an issue. And we want to understand how it applies to the home and to our health and how it's going to affect our clients. At the end of the day, the whole goal of our classes, all the classes I teach is to really help, help you not have that deer in the headlight look when a client asks you a question about a topic, but either you know the answer because you remember it from my class or that's a good question. I know a guy who's got the answer and you can reach out. So help you uh, look good. Um, so here's the, the topics we're going to go through. Understanding what is mold. We're going to understand a little bit more how does it grow, what makes it grow, and where. We're going to go through different areas of the home and understand the problem areas and what we're looking for when we're trying to identify or locate mold. How we control it, prevent it, how we clean it up, and then how it all fits into the home inspection or due diligence process when it comes to mold testing. So, uh, Lurie, can I pick on you and have you read our definition of mold? Special opt woolly growth produced especially on damp or decaying organic matter or on living organisms. Okay, so I... <laughs> I like to just kind of start off and set the stage for what, it, what we're dealing with when it comes to mold. This is the definition, but this is our problem that we run to, into, especially with real estate. Because the definition is so broad, you get lots of opinions and lots of, lots of information. Um, so if you take this definition, you can almost say that's a pretty broad definition. You could apply that definition to my facial hair because it is a woolly growth. On, an org on a living organism. And so again, not to downplay mold, it, it can be a problem, but it's also all around us. There's a lot of things that fall into that category that aren't necessarily going to make our clients get sick and die. That's, you know, that's kind of what we're getting to. There are thousands of species of mold, thousands more that we haven't even really studied or identified. The reality with homes, with real estate, there's only about 50 that we're dealing with. Not 50,000, just 50. So there's just a few that we're going to encounter. Um, it is a fungus. It's everywhere. So number one, if a client ever asks you, do you think there's mold in this house? The answer is always yes. There's mold everywhere. So is there mold contamination? That's kind of what we're worried about. But mold is everywhere. If you didn't have mold in your home, you could leave the food out on the countertop and it would never grow anything but there's mold spores and they're looking for places to grow. Um, it's necessary in our ecosystem to break down organic matter. And that's, I mean, the whole concept of a landfill is that you are going to put your garbage out there and eventually it's gonna break down. The whole idea with compost or soil, it's kind of that time of year where people are getting their gardens ready and you're putting compost. Well, compost is just soil that 
fungus has already broken down. And so it, it's part of our system. It's everywhere. Um, so it, mold is not really a plant, but if you kind of think about that, because that a lot of people can relate to that. If mold, the mold is like a plant, the spores are the seeds. So wherever those seeds fall, plants can grow if they have the right conditions. Um, mold also can have harmful effects. So it can be toxigenic. So to some of them will produce toxins. Some of them are allergenic, meaning they trigger an immune response or an allergy. And then there are some that are pathogenic that it can actually cause diseases in people. And so, so that's, it, it's because of those things that we have all of this, this stereotype or this fear, especially our clients when it comes to mold. And that's what we need to keep in perspective. So that's one of the goals of this class. Okay, so you guys here don't need to worry about it. You guys that are online, that is your first keyword. So make sure you write that down. Ah, uh, yeah, they're supposed to be. Don't leave before, we'll, we'll, right. we'll get one in <laughs> Just need to get your license number and your last name. So we'll be, I'll make sure to get that. Um, okay. So again, kind of another, again, going back to this dilemma where what is mold? When should I be worried about it? Most reports on mold say it can potentially trigger the following reactions in sensitive people. So part of the problem with mold in our society and the real estate industry is the litigious nature of some of our, you know, of our culture and communities. You know, this is, this is how it would be worded by an attorney. Most reports, so not all, can potentially, not that they're going to, but they could, trigger the following reactions in a sensitive person. Are you sensitive? My wife will sometimes say my a pretty... Uh, what does she say? You do you have feelings? I'm just <laughs> so I'm not very sensitive. So mold must not affect me. No. So that's kind of, again just tongue in cheek. That's kind of what we're dealing with. Is really what is bad, what's not, and that's what we need to keep in perspective. Uh, one of the biggest things is a lot of people can be affected by mold because it triggers an allergic reaction. And what is an allergy? It's an immune response to something our body doesn't like and doesn't doesn't recognize. And that's something to keep in mind is our cats bad, our dogs bad, yet some people have allergies to them. So does that mean that we should just get rid of all cats and dogs? Well, so same type of thing. Not everybody's going to have the same reaction to mold. It kind of depends if their body is sensitive to it or if it has that, that trigger. And, and uh, you know, so, so some people are going to be affected by others or not. So one, one that a lot of people don't realize is, do any of you guys have penicillin allergies or know someone that has a penicillin? So penicillin is probably one of the most common molds that we find in a home. So if you have a penicillin allergy and the home has a high penicillin problem, you see how this allergy could trigger, but it doesn't mean that everybody that goes in that home is going to have that same sensitivity and those same problems. So, um, the other issue is respiratory complaints is if you think about it, mold spores are microscopic. You're not going to see them. But a lot of people can relate to the fact that if you go into a construction site and they're sanding down the drywall, getting it ready to paint, and there's dust everywhere, you're probably going to have some respiratory issues if you're not protecting yourself. Well, you can have just as much particulates with spores if you walk into a home that has a lot of mold but you can't see that dust because they're much finer. And if you aren't protecting yourself or doing something, then you are going to have some respiratory issues because your lungs are still going to be affected by all of that stuff that's floating around in the air. And so you, yes, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Was it mold? Well, yeah, it's just because it's a bunch of junk, not just because it's mold. So again, keeping things in perspective. Um, just other facts, healthy people should not be affected by small or even moderate amounts of mold. Uh, excessive mold can cause symptoms with anyone. And excessive exposure, that's another thing. The way our immune systems work is our bodies can tolerate certain things. But once we're exposed repeatedly to the same thing, our body starts to build up and our body's defenses will start to say, okay, you know, that was kind of rough the last time we dealt with this. So the next time it comes up, we're going to put the defenses up even sooner. And so some people have noticed that. I even noticed that when I first started inspecting, I went into a house and then I got up into the attic. Um, this was a rental property down south of BYU. 
and and there were uh, I think there were six female students living in this one house with one bathroom, and the bathroom vented up into the attic. So all that humidity, when I got up into the attic, it was almost like in some places someone had stapled shag carpet to the underside of the roof because it was so furry with mold. So being a new inspector, you know, and I had just like the simple little dust mask that everybody's wearing during COVID. And okay, wow, oh, that's that's interesting. Took lots of pictures. And and because I was I had excessive exposure, I had a headache for like the next day or two. And then um, I and then a, a week later, I walk into a house, and right when I walk in the house, I was like, <clears throat> I started feeling kind of just you know like like oh there's something in here, kind of wanting to cough. And I got down in the crawl space. Sure enough, there was mold everywhere. So my body was on heightened awareness because I had all that exposure. So again, anyone can have that, and it, and it may not may not be that now that second home was really that bad of a problem, but because my body was aware and was on alert. It kind of triggered that. Other people that have a especially compromised respiratory system in any way, they're going to be affected more so. Um, children, infants, elderly. So this is the big one that you've probably heard of, maybe not by this name, Stachybotrys or Stachy. That is black mold. So that's one of the ones that we hear a lot about. We want to just kind of set the record straight. Um, you know, I've had clients come up and say, well, yeah, we want to do a mold test. We're not too worried about, you know, molds as long as it's not black mold. Um, and then I've heard, and, 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 you know, it's also called toxic mold because Stachybotrys does produce toxins. Um, it is usually black, but it can be other shades of green or brown. Um, there's lots of other molds that are also black. Um, I've seen on seller's disclosures, you know, not black mold. You know, we don't. So. Again, um, this is from the Center for Disease Control in regards to Stachybotrys. The hazard should be considered the same as other common molds. So whether it's black mold, stachy, toxic mold, or it's aspergillus, which is probably the most common one we find, doesn't really matter from a health perspective. Um, it's mold. We want it out of our house. But having black mold doesn't make it more or worse. Why, why that kind of happens is kind of a side note. Why stacky kind of gets a, a bigger, gets more attention? Um, it's for a couple of reasons, in my opinion. One is stacky botrys requires a constant moisture supply. So if you have a stacky problem, you've got a pretty big problem where you could have an aspergillus problem and that's just more, you know, you don't dust very often, the humidity, you know, you've got a small cooler and, don't, and you don't ever clean out your furnace filter, that furnace filter can start to grow aspergillus. Um, but if you have stacky, you've got like a leak that's been going on in the wall or through the foundation that's been going on and on and on. Um, the other thing too is stacky botrys, the spores are much bigger. And so you can't, if you start getting a high concentration of spores, and we'll talk about sampling and how we do the testing, it's usually just the tip of the iceberg, where with aspergillus, you could be getting. So again, it's not that it's a bigger problem. It's just once you do catch it, yeah, it's the tip of the iceberg. You probably have a bigger problem that you need to be taking care of. Um, so some things to be, be aware of can only be identified through laboratory tests. And here's another kind of uh, myth or just, uh, again, set the record straight. Uh, the term mildew. We hear that a lot. So mildew, just to get factual, mildew is a fungus. It's a white powdery fungus that grows on certain plants. Technically, that's what mildew is. But like lots of language over the years, it evolves. And now mildew has become part of our language. Now it's in the dictionary and it's synonymous with mold. So and I see this several times on seller's disclosures. You know, we've never had a mold problem, but we have lots of mildew. Tomato, tomato, it's kind of the same thing. So make sure your clients understand that. Or I hear agents sometimes say that on the inspection. Yeah, we, because, so from a home inspector standpoint, liability wise, we're taught as far as liability and is if we're not there hired as a mold professional, we should avoid the term mold. That's just how courts and lawsuits have kind of got crazy. So if we're not there to do any sort of mold testing or in that capacity, then we avoid the term because we're not there for that. And so we used fungus, fungal, mildew, and things like that. 
So sometimes in inspection, your inspector might say, well, you've got some staining up here. And then the agent will be like, oh, no, that's just mildew. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it is mold. We're not going to say it's mold because technically, you know, you need a laboratory test, blah, 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 blah. But, but mildew mold, it is synonymous. It's just like every other four-letter word here in Utah County has an alternative. Mildew is mold's alternative, okay? Um, and in fact, some of that mildew in your bathroom could be stacked buttress. So don't, uh, don't discount it. Um, code word number two. So those of you online, go ahead and check that one out. Question. Does the stacky have a particular odor? I mean, I, I, I know after having been in rentals so many years, I once went in a house one time, I was getting ready to do, you know, take over management of it. I walked in the house and I told the homeowners, you need to check for mold in this house. And they said, oh, no, 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 there's no problem, never like that. Well, they moved out, we put somebody new in. Months later, we found out that because of some sort of, they had abandoned a, a sewer line and then when you, have, and they never capped it. And when, and so, path of least resistance, all the sewer was accumulating underneath the house for years. And so, but I could smell that when I went in, same with another property where we went in after COVID, they, we couldn't go in to do inspections during COVID. She was moving out. I walked in the house and it, my eyes started to sting because of the, of the smell. I couldn't believe they had lived in there for yeah. months with that. So I find that it has a, a and it, just stuff that's been there for a long time, there's just a peculiar odor to it. So yes, I'm trying to think if we talk about that, but let's yeah. now. So there's a couple of things there. One is, so what I've seen change just while I've been doing inspections is, and we'll talk more about testing, but one of the other tests that is becoming more prevalent when it comes to mold testing is a, a VOC test. So VOCs are volatile organic compounds, you're probably more familiar if you've heard about them with chemicals and paints and other varnishes and things like that. Give off that smell. VOCs can be toxic. They can be carcinogenic, like formaldehyde can, can cause problems. So they have this category of VOCs called microbial VOCs. And what it is, is as a mold is growing, it actually will produce toxins and toxic gas as a defensive mechanism to inhibit other molds from growing. And stachybotrys is one of those more toxic, and so that it will take over. And, and so those toxins, some have an odor, some don't. Um, so that's what I was saying is one of the things that's changed is now we now now there's options for testing. So um, for example, my um, my brother's been having some issues. And so we did the test and the traditional spore tests. This house is like one of the cleanest ones I've I've tested, but then we did the the VOC test, and it did show, and basically, if you have some MVOCs, that means you do have some actively growing mold, and so then you can kind of start looking at it. Um, it was at a low enough level that, you know, according to the lab and stuff, it's like, yeah, that's probably just, you know, you have a, a dirty floor drain that's kind of growing stuff from condensation going in, or a lot of it around windows and stuff, so so it's sensitive enough that it's going to pick that up. So there are smells. Now, the other one that you mentioned is that, that's a very common thing that I'll get calls on is, hey, I think I've got a mold problem. I smell this. And the first thing I'll say is, do you have a bathroom that's not used? Oh, yeah, the guest bathroom downstairs. So every drain has a P-trap, that little loop. And the whole idea is that it stays full of water and that creates a seal. Well, if it doesn't get used, it evaporates. And now you have sewer gases. And those sewer lines, so we, we started scoping sewer lines in the last year and when you see sewer lines it's no wonder that those smells come up because you know yeah it's sewer but they're just coated and lined with grease and all kinds of other stuff and that those smells are going to rise right into your home so um so the p-traps is definitely a big one um probably the more common place that we'll find it is uh under laundry room you know the laundry room often has a floor drain and water never goes in there because you're hoping your washing machine isn't leaking but but that's one that often happens. A trick is you can dump a few tablespoons of mineral oil or vegetable oil because oil rises and that kind of creates a little bit of a barrier so the water won't evaporate as quickly. So uh, 
Okay, so mold needs four things to grow. Spores, which are everywhere. Nutrients, nutrients are anything organic. So paper on drywall, a big, a big contributor to nutrients in our homes is what makes up a lot of the dust in our homes? Skin cells. So skin cells are organic, great food source. Um, like a lot of times it's like, well, there's mildew all around the caulking of my shower. Well, caulking is not organic. There's no food source there. So if you have mildew on the caulking, the caulking has started to fail and you're getting soap residue, which has a lot of skin cells. And so if, if, the, if the caulking is pretty bad, that means it's time to replace it. Otherwise it shouldn't be growing any sort of mildew. Um, grout tile, or the tile grout is very porous. And so if it's not kept sealed, what they sell sealers to seal grout, then it gives a good place where those you know, roots, so to speak, of the molds can start growing. So nutrients are everywhere. Temperatures. So again, there's going to be molds that grow in freezing temperatures and molds that grow in super hot temperatures. But those 50-ish that we're dealing with in our homes, they're in their homes because they like these temperatures. That's why a refrigerator works, because the molds that are in our home don't like 40 degree temperatures. So your food doesn't grow mold because they don't like those temperatures. The only, so a mold needs these four things to grow. We can't really do anything about the top three. The only thing that we can control is moisture. Mold needs moisture of some sort to grow. And so one thing we often hear is, well, we're in a desert. So that's why we don't have as much mold problem. And, and yes, that's kind of true because we don't have to worry about this high humidity always causing things to have this dampness. But we still have other forms, and this relative humidity is still an issue here in Utah. So relative humidity, a lot of people think of, oh, humidity, you go to the south, it's humid. Well, relative humidity, it's relative to the temperature. So when we talk about humidity, humidity, when the, when the air temperature is warmer, it can hold more moisture content. When the temperature is colder, it loses it. That's what condensation is. So you have your, your can of Coke. July 4th, you're at the picnic and it starts beating up with condensation. That's because the air temperature that was 100 degrees with 70% humidity dropped down to 60 degrees and the humidity percentage, the relative to the temperature went above 100% and condensed. That's why it condenses on your windows. That's relative humidity. And we have a lot of that in Utah, for example, because we have drastic temperatures. So in the winter time, it could be 10 degrees outside. We keep our homes at 70 and that warm air gets up into the attic, for example, and hits the underside of the roof and it can actually start to drip. I've been in attics where I've come out wet because it's been dripping so much and there's poor ventilation. Um, so that's relative humidity. Crawl spaces are another one. You have moisture coming out of the ground. And if it's not well insulated, you're gonna get condensation forming against the rim joists and floorboards. Um, water vapor, that's your humidity. Bathrooms, not using exhaust fans. Um, I did a house a couple of weeks ago and they just complained about, you know, it's such a humidity problem. Um, and uh, it, it, it was a divorce situation. And so she was just trying to, figure out what do we need to do with the house. So, so it was a little bit different situation. Um, but you can see the stains on the walls. They've got three teenagers, lots of long showers, and you can see where the condensation was dripping on the walls. And they had two big exhaust fans, but when I went into the attic, they, the home was originally a lot of homes built in the 60s, 70s. They just vented them to the attic. Um, and that should be going to the outside. So they took it to the outside, but what they did is they joined the two together and went to one. So basically that meant when one was on and the other one wasn't, they were just pumping it from one bathroom to the other back and forth and they weren't really doing anything to get it out of the house. So that water vapor is a, is a, big, a big one. Um, I tell a lot of my clients, investors, when we're doing inspections, that if you are doing a rental, get rid of the switch for the exhaust fan. Just put it on a, a motion sensor or just wire it into the light because tenants often don't want to have that exhaust fan going or they don't let it run long enough to get the humidity out. And then it's gonna to start to form mold and then they're gonna complain and you're gonna have a headache to deal with. So just eliminate that option and it comes on all the time. Um, moisture, that's, that's your leaks. That's the leaking faucet, leaking drain, leaking roof, leaking foundation, washing machine, all of those things. So again, 
We can control all of these if we're aware of them. That one always has slime. What can you do? For like in floor drain? <laughs> that's that's the one that, that was like the most common when you have mild microbial VOCs or like check your floor drain. Um, so uh, a lot of them are just keeping it clean out, pouring some, some cleaner, spraying some cleaner down there regularly. Um, uh, any of your, uh, Tylex is the one that I like, a little bit of bleach. Um, that's one of the, we're kind of going off topic here, but that's one of the things we always get questions like, well, is that to code? Is that to code? Code is, is great, but there's some parts where code don't really make sense. And that's one of them is floor drain is technically a waste drain, but then for example, you have a water softener that needs to drain into there when it discharges, but you code says you can't have that drain going into that drain it has to go onto the top. It can't be. So that's an example is, well, you have a lot of water kind of always splashing around, always creating those, those problems. Um, I would say the best thing is, is most, almost all floor drains, that cover can be removed. A lot of times it gets grouted in place, but it can be removed. And, and what happens is it's kind of a big reservoir that, that, you know, funnel. And so dust, and we talked about dust, but if, if that's kept clean and scrubbed out, there's really nothing for mold to grow on. So that, that slime is more just bacteria that starts to grow a, a biofilm. And so again, spraying it down. So that's why I like the Tylex because that's, so we use in our bathroom, so you can spray it down there and clean it clean as well. Okay. You need to stick a toilet brush there handy and just so yeah, we have one right right in floor, you know, a mechanical room in our laundry room. And so pick it up, scrub it out real quick, spray it down. Locking um compression disposals, you know, little baffles that are there. You reach under there, it's full of mold. So I usually take a scrub brush every once in a while. And so I tell my gent. If you if you're smelling that, take a scrub brush and just go up and down inside that and scrub out your disposal. Yeah. Um we we like the uh lime rickies or strawberry limeades at the Sonic and stuff. And we make a habit of pouring all those extra lime chunks into the disposal, and that helps kind of clean out that insides. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're gonna run through our homes and where we find mold problems and where to keep an eye out for things. So bathrooms, obviously a big one. And let me just uh, preface this. So uh, like I said, pillar to post is nationwide. Um, one of the guys that put this together is from a more humid climate. So there's a few things like, like this one, remove moisture from tubs and shower walls, which really is not applicable to us here in Utah. I mean, you should because of our hard water, <laughs> but not from a mold perspective. Um, I've left a lot of those in there because we have had clients come from other parts of the country and there's gonna be a few in here that you're gonna be like, what? And when you get one of those clients, again, the whole goal of this class is so that you have that background and not have that deer in the headlight look of like, wait, what do you, why, why would you, why would you not want it? One of them in here is never put carpet in a basement. You know, and we'll hear that every once in a while. We'll get a client who comes from an area where they don't even have basements and they're kind of freaked out about it or they come from a climate where you would never put carpet in a basement. That's that's just a recipe for mold. Well, not in Utah. So bathrooms, turn that fan on. They recommend leaving it on for a half hour um, after, after showering. Um, cleaning and replacing caulk. We talked about that. Cleaning and sealing the grout. And then checking around toilets. We find a lot of problems with toilets. Um, probably the most common one is you redo the flooring in the bathroom and then you put the toilet back. Well, when you redo the flooring, you just raise the level. And if you don't get a new bigger seal, they start leaking. And then there's another code one. Code says you have to caulk around that toilet. Well, you do, and then it starts leaking. You're never gonna know about it. <laughs> and it's gonna get underneath that flooring. And that line darkens the, oh, oh, homes. the linoleum is kind of dark. That's old up underneath the- Yeah, we just had one. Um, yeah, just a few few months ago where the linoleum wasn't wasn't stained. And so that was like, okay, it's not stained, but it had some wrinkles. And it's like, yeah. And you know, we checked it with the moisture meter. We, you know, it's dry. I mean, the home is occupied. They've been using the toilet. It's dry, but you want to check this out. There's something going on. Sure enough, when they pulled it up, they're like, hey, you didn't tell us there was going to be mold under there. We're like, 
we kind of told you everything up to there. That's kind of what, you know, what happens when there's a lot of water problems, there's often mold. Um, laundry areas, make sure your dryer goes to the outside. And, and that's another one too, actually the same house that has the condensation problem when we, uh, the, from all the humidity, the dryer vent, when they, they had an addition, so they had to reroute the dryer vent, but it has a ton of elbows. And in general rule, every, every 90 degree on a dryer vent is equivalent to a five foot length. So general guidelines, kind of a lot of manufacturers kind of say 20 feet with four nineties. So if you've got six nineties, then technically you only get 10 feet of distance. And so this one is about 25 feet with about six nineties. And so when you look in the dryer vent, you can just see it's coated. Cause what happens is that warm humid air is getting pushed out, but like condensation, if it, if it starts to cool before it gets out, it starts to make it damp and you have all that lint. And so it's slowly making this cocoon of lint that has lots of organic material and in a lot of humid environment. And if you don't aren't drying clothes every single day, it's a perfect environment for mold to grow. And so you start getting funky smells in your laundry room. Um, again, just anything that you are doing that is maintaining moisture in the room, laundry in the tub, uh, dry the laundry tub. Again, if you leave it open, it's going to dry in some climates. No, um, that's a big one. Once the uh, front loader washing machines came about, that's the big problem because those have to be watertight, obviously, to fill up with water. But that means they're airtight too. So if you close that door, that's, you know, that, there were so many recalls because they started growing mold and everybody's laundry stunk. Just dry it out and make sure it dries. Just okay. leave the door. By closing it, and I just go by, just yep. open it, and I don't have a problem. It's, uh, yes. Bedrooms and living rooms. The biggest problem with bedrooms and just general living areas is dead air space. So when you, if you have a home that's built prior to the 70s, the likelihood that your walls are insulated is very low. They, they didn't, just didn't insulate walls. Um, so that means your walls are going to be cold. You have that condensation issue that we're talking about. Warm, humid air hits a cold surface, starts to form condensation. So if you, if you don't have air circulating, you have that that likelihood, that moisture. So especially if you have, um, I've got a picture later on, I'll show you that, you know, like a couch or furniture that's up against an exterior wall and especially a north wall because a north wall doesn't get any sun to heat it up as well. So those north walls are usually the worst or drapes. So you have that cold surface and dust and it's just going to start accumulating and, and start growing. Um, you've probably seen in some homes, it's usually with vaulted ceilings, and you'll see these black streaks where the rafters are. We call that ghosting, and that's the same concept. So if you think of the way that the roof is built, you have the rafter, and then you have insulation and the rafter. So the insulation is going to be a little warmer because heat transfers through that solid rafter a lot more than the insulation. So if you were to look at it with an infrared camera, for example, you'd see cold, warmer, cold, warmer. So colder is going to have a little bit higher humidity level. So any dust floating around in the air is gonna to tend to stick there. So that's what it's causing it. Um, it might not be the rafters, it might be kind of a, an area. I remember having a home where, so picture this is the master, the master suite. And along the whole corner, there was just this kind of dark stain. And the client was worried, is the roof leaking? Do we have mold up there? When I got up in the attic and looked, they were right at the mouth of the canyon and the wind just hit that corner of the house and pushed all the insulation. So that was just, drywall and exterior. So there was no insulation. And because it was a master suite, no real barrier between the bath, master bathroom and the master bedroom, all that humidity was just starting to form some condensation up there and, and cause some problems. So, so that ghosting is, is often an issue. If you see a lot of it, look around, they're probably burning candles or incense, which same thing has that soot that will then attract and stick there. Is it just a matter of cleaning that off? Then? So it is cleaning it off. And then the best way to avoid it is to improve air circulation. So the number one way is use your ceiling fans year round. So there's a switch on the ceiling fan, blows down in the summer, blow it up in the winter. And that's going to help keep that air moving. So you don't have that temperature dropping as it gets to the wall because it's constantly circulating. Just get air movement. Uh, number of plants. So obviously, Plant, good planting soil, potting soil has lots of microbial activity. Um, and so if you are concerned with mold and you have all these other ones, maybe having tons of plants isn't always the best idea. 
keeping stored materials away from the walls. I managed a property some years back where they were using a spare room as a storage unit and it was filled to the rafter with boxes. And when they moved out, it was mold all around there. So I no longer allow people to yep. use it. You know, you need to get a storage unit. You cannot use a bedroom as that. You pay for it now you, because it creates that problem. It does. Yeah. So especially especially older basements that, that don't, you know, you have a lot of these homes in, you know, 50s and 40s and 30s homes where the basement was finished to make more living space. And a lot of times they just paint the foundation wall. And so that moisture is constantly coming through that foundation. And if it can't get into the room and kind of disperse, it's just going to sit there. That's where you start seeing the paint all fall, falling off. Or sometimes we'll even see where it started to break down the concrete and it's all falling apart. <laughs> white powder. Yeah, we're going to talk about the white powdery stuff in a minute. Kitchens. Um, just make sure things are vented. So a lot of range hoods actually just recirculate. They don't go to the outside. But still using them with what we just talked about, it's dispersing that and helping keep everything balanced. Um, refrigerators have drip pans. A lot of people don't know that, but there's a little reservoir so that as condensation builds up on the coils, which doesn't happen too often here in Utah, but it has a little reservoir where it will collect. And so if you go and look for yours tonight, you'll probably find that it's full of dust and lint and a great little Petri dish for growing stuff in your, in your kitchen. Um, Leaks under your sinks or on your dishwasher, taking your garbage out regularly. Basements, crawl spaces, and attics. That's where we usually find mold problems because it's a little bit more out of sight, out of mind. Um, what we just talked about, a lot of stored materials because if you don't see it, you're not going to catch it. Uh, dehumidify. We don't really need to worry about that as much here in Utah. Avoid carpet. No, not in Utah. Um, if you have sub pumps, check those. I actually just talked to someone yesterday that... Uh, with all the water, they went down and found out, wait, where's all the, how come my sump pump's not working? I guess something had caused the float not to work. And so making sure they're working. And then also if they're not used frequently, they can start growing stuff inside the sump pumps. Standing water. So anytime someone has a crawl space, I always tell people just, you know, this time of year, springtime, just check it, just stick your head down there. Make sure you don't see any signs of standing water. Um, I remember one home, I went to, it was, uh, this was way back when there were tons of foreclosures. So this was houses getting foreclosed on and uh, got up into the attic and the attic just had mold everywhere. And so as I'm moving down the, you know, we started to top work our way down. Um, every bedroom had uh, had air filters and purifier purifiers. So like, okay, they're having some air quality stuff. And as I get down into the crawl space, the crawl space had a sump pump that was dead. So there was about a foot of water, just there's a lake. And the furnace was in the crawl space, kind of hanging from the, the floor joists. So it was just pumping that humidity through the whole house. And, you know, and so it was, yeah, no wonder you need it. And the funny thing is, is I bet they probably had about a thousand dollars worth of room purifiers where a sump pump is like maybe a hundred bucks, you know, 200 bucks that could have solved it off. Um, vapor barriers. So that wasn't really standard till 70s or 80s, but that plastic barrier, there's a lot of moisture that comes up out of the ground. And so you want to keep that in the ground, not let it get into your home. That white powdery that's on the concrete, and I've got some pictures later on, look at that. It's called efflorescence. And what it is, it's the minerals, the salts that are in concrete, and as water passes through, and then the water evaporates, it leaves those, those minerals behind, and it's called efflorescence. Sometimes you know, because a lot of the rock, they, they're probably synthetic or cult or man-made stones, a lot of a lot of the, the veneers that they do. So it's just a concrete product. And so water's getting in. So the one thing we tell people is kind of look at where the water's coming from. And if it is just a normal, you know, just rain or whatever, and it's kind of dispersed, but if it's kind of localized, you want to look, okay, maybe you've got a gutter that's going where it shouldn't or sprinklers that are going where they shouldn't. Um, but any of that efflorescence is a sign that more water has been there than probably should. And the more you can do to direct it elsewhere. Um, as far as concrete and stuff, you want to be careful, but muriatic acid is the best thing for cleaning it up. Um, but some of those you want to make sure it's not going to discolor them. So it, it just should be surface. So anything, just a rough scrubbing it off. Yep. So exterior, the main thing is this term called the building envelope. That is everything on your house that keeps the outside out and the inside in. 
If that gets compromised, you have a potential for water intrusion, which then leads to mold. And that's the other thing I always tell people is mold is not the problem. Mold is a symptom of the problem. The problem is water. You get rid of the water, you get rid of the symptoms. Um, so if that building envelopes, that could be the weather stripping around your door. And it doesn't mean that water is always going to come in, but if cold air is coming in, you have a condensation point as well. So checking that building envelope, everything that should be keeping outside out and inside in has to be consistent and uh, maintained. Uh, um, we're just going to keep moving along. There is number three for our virtual. Well, sometimes get tenants that say, we have a mold problem. We're always getting sick and we had somebody come out and they tested for mold and it's everywhere and we need you to mitigate it. And I tell them, okay, I need to know mold is the symptom. I need to know the root cause where, you know, check this, check that. No, we just have mold. You just need to mitigate the mold. Like, I can't mitigate the mold. Like let's stick on a pig. I can't yep. mitigate something and I don't, where I don't know the source. I need to know the source. Right. What's causing it. What's yep. causing the issue. Usually because they they keep everything so airtight. They get condensation on the window. It grows the little mold along the window. The tracks. Yep. And so the, I don't know inherently if it, in and of itself is causing their illnesses, but they may be extra sensitive to something. Right. And I always tell people, the ceilings in your bathroom, so you clean. The ceiling fans that have the nice. That build up the moisture. Yeah. So one thing um, I've, I've talked about with a lot of uh, investors, landlords, is uh, just invest in a hygrometer. So it's a thermometer, but it tells you humidity. And if humidity levels are over 50%, you have a potential for mold issues, especially if it's cold outside. And so you just, I mean, they're 10, 15 bucks on Amazon and just mount it. And if, you know, so especially that's what I tell people with have swamp coolers, they're kind of, you don't see as many swamp coolers now, but um, swamp coolers especially are putting that humid air in, but a swamp cooler should be replacing warm air with cooler air. If it's not replacing it fast enough, then that's where humidity starts to build up. And so with, with, with tenants, with anyone, it's real easy. You put that hygrometer. If it goes over 50%, you don't have enough windows open, or it's so humid outside that your swamp cooler is not doing anything. So just check that. If it's over 50%, you don't have enough windows. And if it keeps getting over 50%, don't complain about mold problems because that's where it's coming from. And if you can't get it low, that's where you call your landlord and say, hey, we can't keep our humidity levels low. Then you start looking at other options. All right, so you find a mold problem, what do you do about it? Cleaning it up. So the main thing to keep in mind is how much mold is too much. The general guideline, and, and technically when it's considered contamination, is when it's more than 10 square feet. So not very much, but still pretty decent amount. Um, that kind of came to play and kind of where I learned about that was we had a, an appraiser that commented that he saw mold in a bathroom. So that held up the whole lending process. And so we went out and we tested it. We did a test and it came back. Yep, there's mold spores, but not anything significant. Well, the underwriter didn't understand mold reports. I'm like, well, there's still mold there. We have to get rid of it. And it's like, oh my gosh. So we finally had a, a professional write a letter that says, hey, it's under 10 square feet. It's not even considered contamination. It doesn't even require a professional to clean it up. And that kind of solved it. So you want to get a professional to come and take care of it, especially when it's in that 10 square feet or greater, not because a professional knows how to clean better or has better chemicals for cleaning. The whole idea with a professional cleanup is they are better at containment because once you get into that much, the quantity of mold spores that if you aren't careful, the amount of spores that you can disperse and then contaminate the rest of your home is significantly greater. So it's more about containment than it is about cleanup when you get into that, that higher amount and those, those professional levels. Um, so again, then beyond that, it, you have to look at what it, where's the mold source. If it's a washable surface, so something that's durable that I can clean off, okay, great. If it's raw drywall, if it's carpeting, you can't really clean that all up. And usually replacement is required for, for some of those things. Um, wood. Yeah, if it's if it's you know raw wood, you know studs and and uh, and two by fours and you know or the attic, they can spray some pretty harsh chemicals. Uh, there's things they can do to clean it off. 
Um, concrete, obviously, you can be pretty harsh. And so it kind of just depends. Are you going to be able to not just, there's a few different concepts here is a lot of people just say, oh, you use bleach. Bleach is great for, for killing things, but not cleaning things. So think of it in this terms, you just go out and you work in the garden all day, you come in for dinner. Do you wash your hands or do you hand sanitizer? Do you want to wash all the dirt and junk off or do you just want to sanitize it and disinfect it? So when you just are using bleach to clean up mold, you're not really cleaning it. And so really the recommended cleaning is a detergent. So just soap and water, clean it all up. Then you can go back with some bleach and disinfect and kill anything that's remaining. Um, it's kind of like if you have a pest problem, do you want to kill them or do you want to get rid of the pest? Well, you want to get rid of them. You want to plug the hole so it doesn't happen again. You don't just want to kill them. And that's kind of what we, the, the misconception with mold is, well, I sprayed it with bleach. Well, did you solve the problem that caused it in the beginning? And then did you scrub it down and get rid of it? Because the bleach, even, I mean, you think about this. So um, this will put it in perspective. I, I went to one class and they were talking about just a, um, a random experiment they did. They sent a bunch of their employees home with a piece of pie. Leave it on your counter till it gets moldy, then dump it in the garbage. And then let's do an air test. Um, some of those tests came back in the millions of spores. And it only takes a few spores to start growing. So if your hand sanitizer is 99.9% .9 effective, how many spores out of a million would still be there? So again, 99.9 .9 of a million, where if you just use soap and clean it all up, and now it's 99.9% .9 of a few hundred, that's a big difference as far as what you're cleaning up. All right, we're uh, a little behind here. I'm just going to go through, this is, this is what I was talking about, that couch, you know, you don't get any airspace, you're going to start getting stuff growing behind it. Um, very often when, when people are concerned about mold, we don't have to be too destructive in a basement, especially. Um, a lot of times the baseboard goes up before everything is painted. So the baseboard, it goes right up against raw drywall. So sometimes if you can just, you know, score that, the, the caulking that's there and kind of peek between the baseboard and the drywall, Yep, you got a mold problem. You know, you don't have to be tearing open walls. You don't have to be ripping up carpet. You can do a pretty non-invasive. Yep, you've got mold. And if you see it here, you know the backside's even worse. You know, flooring, a lot of times walkout basements, there's not a good seal there. This one has been going on and on. You can see they've already had to patch and repair the carpeting once. I keep coming back to it. Again, solve the problem. Don't treat the symptom. All right, so inspections. There's a few different types of inspections that a client could do. Um, you could do surface samples. We never hardly do that. A surface sample is where you're actually, oh, I have one here. You're using either a tape lift or a, which is basically, it's a microscope slide that has a real sticky tape. You pull the tape off, you stick it on the surface, put it back on the slide, send it to the lab. They're able to look at it and tell you what kinds of molds are there. You can do a swab, same type of thing. You swab it. Um, sometimes they will put it on a petri dish and grow it to see what kinds of molds are there, or they can just pull that, pull it off, and look at it in the microscope. Um, the more common is the air sample. So these are mold cassettes. There are four, or uh, also called a spore trap. Inside these is a small microscope slide. In here. So a little microscope slide with a really sticky surface. So we hook it up to a vacuum pump and we suck in a calibrated amount of air. So usually 75 liters and anything that's floating around gets stuck to that surface. We send that off to the lab. They're able to look at it. They're able to identify the different types of spores. And then based on the volume of air, they're able to say, okay, on average, you're going to have this many spores for the, per cubic meter. And that's what the mold report that we're going to look at, um, that, we, that we look at as inspectors is, okay, what are the types of molds that are in the home and what's the quantity? Whenever we do a mold test, we always do an outdoor sample as well, because that outdoor gives us a baseline. Um, in general, if we see more than a few hundred spores per cubic meter, that okay, that kind of raises some flags. Over a few thousand, okay, yeah, we, we've got an issue. Um, but I remember doing one out by the lake, by Utah Lake, West Provo, and in the, in the indoor levels were around 1,400. 
It's like, okay, that's kind of high. The outdoor levels was 1700 and it was the same kind of mold. Okay, so is that a mold problem? Probably not. Is it an air quality problem? Possibly, but. And where do you test from? Like the air filter? Like, are you down? So, so the, the spore trap, so there's a little tripod. We just set it in the center of the room. So these traps are good for about eight to 1200 square feet. So think of it kind of like uh, if you were doing a bug bomb. A bug bomb is going gonna, is gonna to go out and kind of get into those nooks and crannies, but only for so much space. And this is kind of the same thing. It's taking a sample of the air, and it's pretty sensitive. We've had some where, wow, we got some weird molds on this. And then, you know, and this was, I had one where new inspector was just training, and it was like, oh, I took that sample right after I got out of the crawl space. So even just shedding a few spores off your, your clothing can sometimes pull that in. You know, other things to consider, tell your sellers, don't clean out the fridge the morning of the inspection. If you're cleaning out a bunch of moldy food and dumping it in the garbage, we are going to pick up those mold spores. Um, so that is the more common type of testing. So here is an example of a mold report. So it's going to tell us, you know, what are the types of, of mold? And usually they're going to be classified. The, as, hey, this is a kind of mold that usually grows when there's a water problem versus some of these are just, yeah, you might live next to a field where there's a lot of, you know, grass that's always decomposing or, um, you know, you live next to the forest and, you know, just there's natural stuff that's kind of normal to, in vegetation, but then there's the kind of that like to grow on the things that we have in our homes. So we, we try to differentiate that. All right, there's our fourth word. So that's the swab test. So that would be like, I think that's mold. The, the, only, the other application of when we might do swab testing is, um, so we did one, uh, had a big house that, that they had a lot, were having lots of issues and wondering kind of how extensive the mold was. And I was saying how stachybotrys is a bigger spore. It doesn't get airborne as much. And so in this one area where they'd have some water flooding in the basement, we took an air sample in that room and it didn't show any stacky, but we did take a swab and kind of swabbed around the baseboards in case there was something growing in the back, you know, behind the drywall. And, and we did pick up a few stacky spores that way. And so Jerry, not your issue, but could have had some. Yeah. I was already in that chat box. And so my screen wasn't showing what you put up for the fourth word. Could you just say it out loud? I can't say it out loud, but uh, chat I'm, with Tana. I, I can't access it because I'm in filling out my license number and stuff, and so it won't show both things on my screen. And you, you need see to it now. chat with me. Go in your chat box. That's where I'm in. I'm actually in the chat box filling that out, so it won't let me go anywhere else. Will I lose everything if I go out? Nope. And I'll wait here. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I can. Mm -hmm. I'll just X out then, start over. Shoot. Okay. Um, it says leave site. Do I dare push you leave? Yep, you're okay. Okay, now I'm not getting anything. Now I'm not getting anything at all. Shoot. Yeah, that was a mistake. Once That's you're okay, in that, once you're in that, it it takes you away from it. Sorry. Don, Don, I'll get you all squared away. I'm screwed now. No, you're not. I'll stay on for a while. Go ahead, Jared, keep going. So just recap, uh, molds are everywhere. So don't uh, ever tell your client, nope, this home doesn't have any mold. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest things too. I realized the first few years I would be like, no, there's nothing that, and I had a few clients in a row within a few weeks of each other say, no, I just got feeling I'm gonna do a mold test. All right, wow. Yeah, there was definitely a problem. We had one and it was the laundry, the washing machine hose had broke a few weeks before we had done the inspection. They caught it, they thought everything was a problem, but enough water had seeped under the linoleum that, you know, a few weeks later it was growing unbeknownst to anyone else. Um, and then we we had another one where, yeah, sure enough, there was something back behind. It was a pretty cluttered house. So, so, so. So here's the main thing is we get all the time clients that will say, well, yeah, I'm curious and I'm concerned with mold, but you know, if you see something on the inspection, let me know. 
I've been doing this enough now that my response to that is, if we see it and we see a concern, we're going to let you and you probably don't need to spend the money on the test because we know there's an issue. And so my recommendation is take care of the issue, then pay the money to do the test to make sure it got taken care of properly. That the testing that we offer as part of the inspection is to catch the ones that we're not going to catch or there is no clue. That's really what the test is designed for. So if someone has, and that's what I've learned, if someone all of a sudden is like, I feel like I should test, our bodies are a lot more sensitive to, to those things. And, and I've seen, I, I'm always surprised. I'm like, wow, I did not suspect that. But somehow they, they had that, you know, that gut feeling to do it. So um, keeping houses in good repair, well ventilated is probably the biggest thing. So attics need to be vented, um, crawl spaces, everything, and then ceiling fans. I'd say ceiling fans and exhaust fans, just making sure that they're working and used regularly are probably one of the biggest ways to help improve that air quality throughout the house. Um, don't paint over mold. Um, you clean it up, you remove it, but most importantly, take care of the source. Um, Significant, hire a professional. Any sensitivities to mold, do sampling. Any unusual smells, you can do sampling just to figure out where things are coming from. Um, there is some information. The EPA has a mold guide that just goes through a lot of general stuff. CDC also um, can just be helpful in helping people keep things in perspective, especially like about stachybotrys. I think that's one of the last pages on the handout is, is the CDC's guideline on stachy, just because so many people are so freaked out about black mold, where it's, we need to keep things in perspective. So, uh, any questions? Okay. Well, thanks, you guys. I need to get a second. Thank you, Jared. And Jared just Jared, to remind you. everybody online, I will stay on for about 10 minutes, so you guys can repeat getting those Google Forms. Make sure the sooner you get those filled out, I can send it to Jared so you guys can get credit. If we have to wait on someone, that takes a little bit longer, so. May I speak to Jared after the class? Name and... Um, that's up to... Jared, could I have a word with you? Sure. Okay. Or do you want, you, you want to reach out to me? At, uh, give me a call on my cell phone. That's probably easier for me. What's the number? Okay, uh, and you got anyone, you guys can write this down. I don't do much for scheduling or pricing, so, but any technical question, you're always welcome to reach out to me on my cell phone. It's 801-318-4343. Okay, thank you.